Uh, thanks to Baton Rouge General Therapies uh, Center. There was a, I think that was a great presentation. Um, very exciting to see that. Um, always, always, always tell patients um, having Parkinson's, getting treatment, it's much more than just going to the doctor and getting pills. It really is a lot more than that. So thanks for proving that. Um, I want to thank too. I, I had thanked some people earlier, but really, the 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 main person behind making all this happen is Ann. Ann, are you here? She's probably doing something, of course. But uh, Ann really makes all this happen. So I want to give a special shout out to her. And um, we've said this before, but the Parkinson support group leaders actually, I, I like to say, kind of pushed us over the edge and 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 made us take the leap to to make this happen. So um, there really, um, really is a grassroots effort, literally. Uh, I want to give a, a little perspective, too, on um, the Baton Rouge scene for Parkinson's. When I interviewed here at Neuromed nine years ago, <clears throat> after my training, they wanted somebody here at Neuromedical Center who specialized in Parkinson's and and had training for deep brain stimulation. So that's why I interviewed here, and I'm from Baton Rouge, so I was very excited, um, especially because there's not many practices like ours in the whole country where there's so many neurologists in private practice who uh, have the facilities and the organization to actually have subspecialties and, and thrive in a subspecialty area. And so I was very excited to come here and so I, so I did, of course, and at the time there were no movement specialists here, so it was, I was happy to come here, and, and there was just this huge void, you know, that I immediately tried to fill, and, and there's so many patients, and now we've grown to a point where we actually have been doing DBS for eight years now with Dr. Waggis Pack. We heard that talk a couple years ago. Uh, we've done over 200 patients here, many of whom are in this room and doing very well. Um, we now have three movement specialists in our practice, me and Dr. Kader and Dr. Whidden. So uh, I don't think any, I don't know of any other private practice in the whole country that has three uh, movement specialists. So that's very unique and we're very proud of that. And because of this conference, it's prompted us to start doing clinical research at Neuromedical Center. So we've heard so far about all the studies that are, that are being done all around the country thanks to Michael J. Fox Foundation, a lot of other people. And we've heard about kind of the, what I would call the upstream part of the research where they're looking at, you know, very hard science stuff, basic science research, even animal models. Um, and, you know, further on down the road when those studies make it and they're proven to work, you know, in animals and proven to work in very small trials in humans and it moves on to bigger trials in humans, really looking at trying to get it approved, those, those are what we call phase three studies, and even phase four is after it's out and, and looking at other things that the, that the drug can do. We've started doing phase three and four clinical trials at the Neuromedical Center, and not just in movement disorders, in Parkinson's, we're doing it for other areas of neurology. We're doing uh, multiple sclerosis research in other areas, and we started off with one clinical coordinator, couple years ago. Now we have basically two and a half. We're doing multiple studies right now. Uh, we've already finished Parkinson's trials and we're starting new ones. Um, so if you're a patient at Neuromedical Center, we, we have a great database and we call and let you know if, if you're eligible for a study and we just uh, present it to you as an option. So um, we're very proud of that. So what I'm gonna like, what I'd like to do now today is talk about some of the new therapies that have been FDA approved this year for Parkinson's. Very exciting to have new things to talk about, new therapies. Um, there's some other areas in neurology that in the past 10 years, uh, I've been jealous because they've had a lot more new things come out. Multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, all these new drugs, and I'm sitting here with all my patients and everybody asks me every day almost, you know, what's new, what's new? And uh, nothing new yet. But now we do have two new things that came out. Actually, the two things I'm going to talk about came out two days apart, ironically. Um, so let's just get right into it. So there's two uh, named therapies FDA approved in early January of this year, Duopa and Ritari. 
and I have the generic names next to the brand names there, and you will see that they're both really levodopa preparations. Levodopa is the active ingredient in these new therapies. Um, levodopa is something I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with as Cinemat or Stelevo. Uh, it's the main active ingredient in those two therapies as well. It turns out levodopa is the most powerful medicine that we know of for Parkinson's, actually by quite a bit. Um, the, the second strongest medicines for Parkinson's are probably the dopamine agonists. And those medicines are strong, but not as strong as levodopa. It gives the most bang for the buck, I like to say. It has the biggest magnitude of effect with lower rate of side effects compared to uh, some other drugs for Parkinson's. So uh, if you notice, every, every time we have uh, all these therapies that utilize levodopa, they also have carbidopa in it. And why is that? Well, carbidopa doesn't itself do anything directly for Parkinson's symptoms, but if you took levodopa by itself, um, it would cause it would directly stimulate, it does directly stimulate the nausea center of the brain. Um, in fact, it's similar to Ipecac, which you may know is an old time remedy to make you vomit up toxins in case kids accidentally swallow it. They used to give it to them to make them vomit. So it's, dopamine is not only utilized in the motor control system part of the brain, but it's also utilized in other parts of the brain such as the nausea sensor part of the brain and the reward center part of the brain and others. So we want to uh, block the nausea part, uh, and that's kind of what the, what the carbidopa helps to do, is to block the nausea so you could take more levodopa to help you. In fact, cinemet in Latin means without emesis. So it's interesting that the, the actual name cinemet literally means uh, without emesis. So, as I mentioned before, levodopa, it's, it's, it's not one of, it is the most effective uh, anti-Parkinsonian agent. It works quickly. Um, if, you, uh, if you live long enough with Parkinson's and, and don't unfortunately die of something else, that this is going to be something that you're probably going to be on. Almost everybody is on it eventually because it's such a good drug. A little timeline here. We first figured out that dopamine was involved in Parkinson's in around 1960. Um, then we, you know, before 10 years were up, we started giving it uh, orally, and we showed that it, that it caused a significant benefit, but with a lot of nausea and vomiting, and it wasn't until the mid-'70s that they started introducing it with medicines like carbidopa. And in Europe, um, if, if you're on a levodopa preparation, they use a different uh, medicine called benzeracide that's just like carbidopa. But same thing, they're, they're these DDCI drugs that, that you see were introduced in the mid-'70s. And that was a big improvement because then we could give a lot more of it. More patients could, could take it, and they could take the amount that they needed. And then we gradually kept you know, uh, improving the way that we gave Cinemet and levodopa. Um, we had some controlled release preparations. The, the first generation controlled release preparations came out in the early 90s. Uh, Cinemet CR, basically, is what I'm talking about. Um, in the late 90s, uh, a class of drugs called COMT inhibitors came out. That's actually the Intacap that's Intacapone, uh, and there was one called Tasmar 2. Intacapone and the other drug, Tasmar, they kind of make the levodopa last longer in the body. Um, so that was another way to kind of boost the effect. Um, that's, what's, that's the third medicine that's in Stilevo, and that's what the actually brand name came out uh, around 2002. And that brings us close to where we are today. Um, Got to show a little bit of graph here, because this kind of emphasizes a very big point, and this, these graphs illustrate the need, why we need new formulations of levodopa, and I'll explain this a little bit. So, I'm going to move here because I, I talk kind of loud. I got, I got a big mouth. Even though I didn't go through the live program, I can still talk kind of loud. Uh, we have a graph here that shows, just, just, just look at this box for now. We have time here, and these are, these 
the, these are dope up levels in the blood. So let's say this point in time is where you, you might take a levodopa pill, and within minutes, the level starts going up in the body as it's absorbed, and then it peaks, and then the liver starts metabolizing drugs like it does every drug that we take, and then the level starts going down. So this represents the levels of the medicine for taking it one time. Early on in Parkinson's, as opposed to later on, uh, we have what we call a therapeutic window. And when the plasma level crosses this line here, that's when the medicine kicks in, okay? That's when you start to feel it work, okay? And when it's, when it's early on, it's pretty much right away, you know, and, and relatively early, you feel an effect. And then, really, you feel, you feel the effect all the way until it goes back down here. So you have this amount of time that it works every time you take it. Okay, great. So, then for patients in a moderate stage of disease, we have a narrower, narrower therapeutic window, meaning um, that more cells have, have died in the substantia nigra area. The brain has less capacity to sort of take up the exogenous or, or the medicine dopamine that we, that we give people has less ability to store it, so uh, less ability, less receptors to work on. Therefore, it takes a little bit higher level, you know, before it kicks in. And then it reaches a point, the top of this therapeutic window is when what we call the dyskinesia threshold so that um, people early on don't have that because they have a wide window. But as the window narrows, a high enough level will cause them to have extra movements. And that's what dyskinesia means. And that's what you might see Michael J. Fox doing in an interview where he's moving, you know, and he can't stop moving. He's kind of wiggling around. Uh, sometimes I call it the wiggles. So uh, people may get the wiggles here. Um, and then when it goes back down, the wiggles will stop. And they're doing okay from here to here. But then when it gets to this level, the medicine wears off. Okay? And then get a little bit more advanced. Now we have a pretty narrow therapeutic window. It takes longer to kick in. Um, from this time to this time, this person's having dyskinesias. From this time to this time, people are doing good again, but then, it, they, but then the medicine wears off, and they're, they're in this off state down here, having more of the motor symptoms, the stiffness, the slowness, the tremors, and they have that all the way until you might picture this whole thing repeating here with the next dose. So, the whole point behind these slides is just to show that people, as they advance with Parkinson's, they have more of this wearing off and they have more of this dyskinesia. So what we'd like to do is even people who are more advanced, keep them more in this window, keep the levels more here, okay? And that's sort of the goals of what these two new therapies can do. I want to point out that these, both of these new therapies are really just variations of giving levodopa improvements, but it's still using the same active ingredient. Therefore, we have to worry about the same side effects. So these are some of the side effects that we worry about. Um, and actually, all of these side effects are, can be even worse with some of the other drugs that we give. So even though we don't want any of these, it's still, you might be less likely to get these compared to some other drugs for Parkinson's. So people can have impulse control disorders, which means they may have a tendency to, to shop or gamble or have some other um, impulsive type behaviors. Um, we talked about how it can cause dyskinesias just because it, it does work on the dopamine system and boost the levels. People can have problems with dizziness, uh, sleeping problems. Um, another part of the brain that dopamine is used for is for dreaming so that's the dream hormone so we're stimulating the dream hormone too and so people can have vivid dreams or even hallucinations which is kind of dreaming while you're awake people will can see things when they're even awake we talked about how it can cause nausea and why it can cause nausea it's been linked to melanoma and, and glaucoma um, so people with Parkinson's should definitely see um, ophthalmologist and 
and dermatologists regularly. We don't probably say that enough in clinic, but that's true. And then this is a fancy word for um, if you're on a lot of Parkinson's medicine and you take it regularly and you abruptly stop, it can cause some, some very bad side effects. Um, very rare, but I just, I just want to point that out. So I mentioned how in the early 90s the, the Cinemet CR first came out, the first controlled release preparation of uh, levodopa. Um, it was exciting at the time, and it, and it was an improvement, but I would argue uh, kind of a marginal improvement because it was, it's a little bit more unpredictable in terms of how it's absorbed from the stomach compared to regular levodopa. So um, that, ca that causes some problems because um, as the disease goes on, people need, to need more predictability in when it's absorbed as opposed to less predictability. So even though we want to make it last longer, if, we don't, if we're not sure how much we're getting, it makes it hard to control the symptoms and it makes it harder for the doctor to change the dose to better fit the patient's needs. Sometimes with this old Cinemet CR preparation, people take it multiple times during the day, but um, there, there would be sometimes kind of a buildup effect because some of it would last longer and some people might have a lot of dyskinesias, dyskinesias by the end of the day and so that can, that can be problematic. Uh, it, is, it was still used, uh, it's still used sometimes. A good time to take this old preparation of Cinemet CR is at night time because it might help people uh, have better levels throughout the night. It might help them sleep a little better. So that is one area that we kind of still used it. But, um, but, but because of these reasons, movement disorder specialists, you know, especially in patients with more advanced disease, weren't, weren't using it as much as we used to. So we needed these, these new therapies I'm about to talk about. Um, so we talked about how we need more predictability with medicines at later stages, not, not less predictability. So we were hoping that when the Cinemet CR came out in the early 90s that it would actually help patients in the long run not have as much of the wearing off and not have as much of the dyskinesias. Uh, but this graph shows really it didn't really pan out. Uh, there wasn't a lot of separation you know, between patients on the IR versus the CR over a period of several years. Um, this graph, all I want to point out with this graph, these are two different studies that were done with, with Parkinson's drugs and they established that even, these were, these were patients who were kind of just started on Parkinson's drugs at an early stage of Parkinson's and these were patients with less than two years of, of, of drugs and you can see that um, even, even at less than two years, you know, 30, 40 percent of patients already started having wearing off and dyskinesias. Um, so if you start off with that relatively early in the course of the disease, those things can just get worse and worse in some people and it can be a real problem. So we wanna, we wanna push those problems, the wearing off and dyskinesias, we wanna push those further off in the future, not, not have them start early. So this slide just points out all the symptoms you can have when the medicine is actually wearing off. And it can be, it is very uncomfortable and it can cause any number of symptoms. And these, these are the, if a, if, if a patient starts to have wearing off, they may complain of one or more of these. Uh, it can be kind of vague and nonspecific symptoms. So it, it takes a good doctor and a good history to, to figure out if it's from you know, not quite the right dose of medicine at the right times. So, Ritari is one of the two things I'll be talking about. That's the new treatment. And um, it is, like I said, it was FDA approved in early January. And it's a mixture, it's a capsule that's specially made so that some of the beads in the capsule are, are immediate release, Cinemat, basically and the other beads in the tablet are controlled release. So you get sort of an immediate boost from it like you really need, but then you get sort of a delayed peak too where it can make it last longer, and that's really an improvement. It comes in four different strengths. 
and these are the, the pictured uh, tablets here. Um, I like to call these, you know, the 100, the 150, the 200, and the 250. I like to round off. I don't like to use uh, those numbers, but those are, those are the four strengths that we have available. So I really talked about this already. Um, why don't we just use regular Cinemet? Why do we even need to take Ritari? It's because people can start to have wearing off between doses. Um, as the disease goes on, people may have to take regular Cinemet instead of three times a day. They may have to start taking it four times a day. A few years later, maybe five times a day, six times a day. Some people even more than that. And that can be very, you know, problematic and it causes a lot of impaired quality of life when you have to take your medicines, you know, X, X times per day. Uh, and then dyskinesias can even happen. So quality of life is impaired. So I'm going to talk about two trials for Ritari. The first study was in patients with new onset Parkinson's. So these were relatively new, newly diagnosed patients. And there was another study looking at more advanced stage Parkinson's, okay? Um, so both of these were uh, placebo. Uh, this was a placebo trial right here, the one for early Parkinson's. Patients were only allowed to be on a study drug and no other Parkinson's drug. For the advanced trial, these patients, they all already were on regular Cinemet. And we'll talk more about the specifics, but patients, almost all of them, um, were on other non-levodopa Parkinson's drugs already. I'm going to jump right to the um, graph showing the outcome. And sorry, I had to make this graph myself, so it's not terribly pretty. But um, this graph shows the baseline uh, score, the baseline motor score at the beginning of the study. So the first day they went in the study, we did all the little tests you know, checking people's coordination and tremor and rigidity, put a number to how bad it was. And we also did the same for the patients in the other groups, okay? And then um, at week 30, at the end of the trial, they did it again to see what the difference was. And you can see the people on placebo, no difference between the beginning and end, which is kind of what we expect. Um, but then for these different strengths of Ritari, the 150, the 250 and the 400, and it's three times a day is what TID means, uh, they had significantly lower scores, okay? And you can sort of see that the higher dose was better than the lower dose, okay? So it, it improved their Parkinson's symptoms as we expected it. Side effects, uh, you can see that we have uh, the different strengths here, so getting stronger, you had kind of more side effects compared to people on placebo. And you see the, the things that we kind of expect with Parkinson's drugs because of what I talked about, how it really acts on dopamine. And we know what dopamine does. It can make you nauseated. It can make you dizzy, uh, have vivid dreams, and s some other symptoms. And so these are the percentage of patients that had those side effects, OK? So let's talk about the second study in advanced Parkinson's patients. Uh, patients were randomized to either Cinemet or Ritari. Um, patients were already on Cinemet. If patients were on other non-levodopa Parkinson's medicines, they were allowed. They were just kept the same. Um, the patients that were randomized to Ritari, they had to do a dose conversion, and I'll explain that in a minute. After patients were changed to a study drug, doctors could move the dose up or down based on what the patients needed for their particular Parkinson's. Um, based on the chart conversion, 60% of the patients actually needed a little bit higher than the chart recommended. 16% of patients needed a lower dose. That was the average dose. Um, and almost all patients were on uh, less than this dose of 2,400. Here's the chart. So if you're on Cinemet and your doctor wants to change you to Ritari, this is kind of what we estimate you will need because the milligrams of Ritari are not the same 
as the milligrams of regular Cinemet. I want to point that out. In fact, you're probably going to need at least twice as many milligrams per day when you add everything together to control your symptoms. But don't let that number alarm you. It's just, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, how it's absorbed in the body. So this is the chart. Um, so you can see these, these patients were, have to take, it's sort of a lot of capsules. You have to take maybe three or four at a time. Um, and you start off three times a day, but your doctor may even start you off on four or five times a day, kind of depending on how much you were taking it before. But however many times you take regular Cinemet per day, if you switch to Ritari, it should be fewer times per day that you need to take it. And that's one of the main advantages of the drug, is that you take it less times per day. So that's less number of times per day that you go through that graph where you have the problems. Okay? So if that graph is repeated three times a day, it's better than being repeated six times a day. And that's, that's sort of the goal, okay? So these are the outcomes. Um, I'm going to just make this real easy to understand numbers. Um, so off time, that's the, that's the time when the medicine's not working. That was the bottom part of the graph where people have more of their tremor and stiffness and slowness. And people on Ritari, they went from having that off time 36% of the time at baseline to 24% at the end of the study. So they had a lower percentage of bad time. People on regular Cinemet, they went down too, just not as much as the people on the Ritari. Similarly, um, looking at total off time, basically with regular Cinemet, they got an extra hour. They went they, had, they lost an hour of bad time per day, but with the Ritari, they lost two hours of good time. So that's, that's better. They also looked at um, the good time. So how much better, how much more was the good time? So the good time went from 10 hours in the Ritari group to almost 12 hours. And with regular Cinemet, it, it went up about one hour. So one hour versus two hours. So um, you can see the there's less bad time and more good time. That's what you want. Okay. Side effects in these more advanced patients. Uh, and this graph shows the side effects that occur in at least 5% of the patients. And it was really only a couple, nausea and headache. Um, and you can see people had more problems initially in the conversion process. But then in the maintenance phase, when the doctors kind of figured out the dose, the side effects were a lot lower. Okay. Five percent of patients um, dropped out because of problems, uh, and they list some of the some of the problems here. So it was some, but not that much. All right, I'm going to switch gears and talk about the other therapy that came out in January, and that's Duopa. And Duopa is a carbidopa, levodopa, enteral suspension. Basically, what that means is it's a levodopa gel that they put into the intestines. Um, it's a pump and cartridge system. It's indicated for patients who have in the on and off and the dyskinesias, and it's becoming a little bit difficult to control. Similar, that's the same indication for getting deep brain stimulation, by the way, so it's kind of an alternative to that. There's no reason you can't have both. The main, one of the main sticklers here is that you have to have a, a gastric tube, so a tube that goes in the stomach through a hole, and that, that is done with a procedure done by a gastroenterologist or a surgeon. You may have heard the term peg tube. It's kind of the same thing as a peg tube, and you can see it goes right through a hole in the stomach, um, but then the tube is fed down the intestine to a part of the intestine called the jejunum, so that's why it's called a peg J tube. So this PEG J tube goes in the stomach, and people have to wear this pump with a cartridge. Here's the medicine, and the pump pumps the medicine through into the part of the stomach where it needs to be. So this is not really a new idea. It's new to this country, but um, intestinal levodopa has been studied since 1988. It's been approved and used in Europe since 2005 under a slightly different name, Duodopa. So we've seen the European data for some time. It just took longer than we hoped for to get to this country, but, it's, but it is finally here. Okay. 
So um, the DUOPA study is only one study I'm going to talk about, and there's a lot of big words here, but I'm just going to make it, make it simple. Randomized means if you wanted to be in the study, then your a computer randomly puts you in one of the two groups, either, either, um, either, either DUOPA or the regular medicine. Double blind means the patients and the doctors didn't know which group the patients were in. Most good studies are done that way. Double dummy means um, since there's two very different things, a pump and a, and a gel versus taking pills, um, patients would know which one they were on, obviously, if they had a, a pump and a gel. So people in both groups had the pump and the tube and the gel, and they both groups took the pills. So that's what double, double dummy means. Uh, patients really did both, but they didn't know which one was real and which one was sort of fake, okay? Active control means both, both sides of the study got real medicine. They just didn't know if it was coming through the pills or, or going through the tube. And it was 12 weeks. And they studied them at the same time. That's what parallel means. So 71 patients enrolled, 66 completed. Um, only three dropped out. Um, and you can see what I thought was interesting, the, the total dose of levodopa was a little bit lower in the, in the DUOPA group. I, I think because it's more efficient, um, you're putting the medicine right where it's kind of absorbed. So overall, patients needed a little bit less overall medicine, which is always good. This graph, um, I know I'll keep showing graphs. I know Randy likes graphs. Raise your hand, Randy. I know you like this. Um, so what this shows is uh, this is a 20-hour um, day, and this is a patient who has the DUOPA pump system. And these are the levels of the levodopa throughout that 20 hours. This is when they first put it on. You put it on in the morning, and you prime it, and it gives you a little loading dose, and then it shoots a continuous dose after that, and it causes you to have a nice, steady level. Now, if the same person was taking the pills, the levels would be up and down all day. And I have a graph showing that, actually. So again, this continuous levodopa delivery, that's our goal in any treatment of Parkinson's because that's what the brain does. We want to mimic what the brain does naturally. And what the brain does naturally is release dopamine all day long, rather continuously. So as close as we can mimic that as possible, that makes patients do better meaning less off time, less dyskinesia time. So with this treatment, at least for the 16 hours a day or so that you're supposed to wear the pump, I mean, you can't really wear it at night, you know, because you don't want to sleep with that on, but at least during the day, you won't have to take any pills, at least not any levodopa pills, theoretically. It bypasses the stomach. So um, patients with Parkinson's, if you take pills that go through the stomach, um, Parkinson's actually causes some problems with the stomach mobility, so food's not pushed, food, food and pills are not pushed through like they're really supposed to be. Um, so we go past the stomach and put it right in the part of the intestine where it's absorbed. So you saw that little cassette. So the cassette with the medicine, it has, it has a lot of medicine in there, and we know exactly how much is in there. We know the concentration and you use one cassette per day. So you basically get up in the morning, you hook up the pump to the tube, you put the cassette in the pump, you turn it on, you start it off with a kind of a pushed bolus dose to get you going, and then it releases it continuously throughout the day. And at the end of the day, you flush it with water to kind of clean the tube, you take the pump off and you go to bed. Some people may have to take pills before they go to bed. Cassettes have to be stored in the freezer, but before you use them, you have to thaw them in the refrigerator for two, three, four days. Um, and then before you put it in, you're supposed to let it room temperature for, for kind of uh, 20 minutes or so before you actually put it in. Here we go. Okay, here's a nice graph showing well, this is kind of the person on the DUOPA, pretty steady levels all day, and the patient on pills, they're going up and down all day. So you could imagine how this person, 
you know, has symptoms going up and down all day too. So that's the improvement. Jump right to the results. Remember, these are the same kind of endpoints that we looked at for Ritari. How much bad time did people have and how much good time did people have? Um, from baseline to the end of the study, um, you can see patients had two hours less of bad time with regular levodopa and four hours less on duopa. So that's a lot better. So two hours more of good on time or two hours less of bad time. Looking at the on time, the good time, uh, they had uh, on the immediate release group, they got two extra hours of good time, four extra hours of good time on duopa. So it did what we hoped and thought it would do. This basically shows the same thing. Let's look at side effects from Duopa. So we have a chart here. This is right from the package insert. And it shows how many, what percentage of patients had these side effects versus regular uh, Cinemat. And of course, um, high number of patients had some problem putting the tube in and going through all the procedure. but. Um, but not that many actually dropped out. And, and it was new to this country, so in, so in Europe they're, they're better at doing that than we are because they've been doing it for 10 plus years. It's kind of new here, and there's probably going to be a little bit of a learning curve. People are definitely going to get better at it. But, and then you have all the regular side effects that people get from levodopa, and a, a lot of these um, are the same because it's the same active ingredient, don't forget. Um, and then these are the specific side effects that can occur with the insertion of this tube to get the therapy. And these are things that can happen, and these are some very, you know, bad things that can happen, but they're, they're all very rare. Um, if you were considering getting this therapy, um, you would definitely have a visit with the GI doctor first so they could talk about these in a lot of detail, you know, as a neurologist, I don't do these procedures, so I don't, I don't know um, the exact percentages that these would occur uh, and how we prevent them. So that would definitely be a conversation to be had with the gastroenterologist. So like I said before, really all the same side effects, but we just hope to have better control during the day with this therapy. Um, the protein ingestion issue is still an issue with um, both of these new therapies, actually, Ritari and Duopa, you know, there's this potential issue where if you're on levodopa to treat your Parkinson's, any formulation of levodopa, if you take or drink protein the same time you take your medicine, it can interfere with the absorption of the medicine into the body. So for some people, that's very important, especially for advanced patients, they have to avoid eating food at the same time they take their medicine. So that's still a potential issue with these two new therapies. One other note, um, in the study, some patients with the Duopa developed neuropathy or nerve damage symptoms. I don't think we understand the link there, but some patients did have that. Um, so you know, I want to make everybody aware of that.